Hey folks, welcome back to the show. Did you know that your omega-3 levels can be predictive of good health outcomes and cholesterol levels? An omega-3 index of 8% or higher is ideal, and yet most people have a percentage of around 4 to 6%. Yours truly over here came in at 5 Today, we're discussing why it's important to measure your omega-3 levels and what you can do to optimize these levels. Plus, we'll answer the question, is there actually a relationship between fatty acids and longevity? My guest today is Dr. Bill Harris, PhD, FASN, and president of the Fatty Acid Research Institute and founder of Omega Quant Analytics. We met at last year's A4M conference, and I was so fascinated by this man, I just knew we had to do a podcast. So what we're doing here today is we're diving into omega-6s and omega-3s and discussing the benefits of these fatty acids, where they come from. We also cover the importance of maintaining a ratio of omega-3 and omega-6 and whether or not omega-3s have an effect on blood clotting and blood circulation. Dr. Harris has been a leading researcher in the omega-3 fatty acid field for over 40 years. He has more than 300 scientific papers on fatty acids and health, the vast majority on omega-3. He's been on the faculty of three medical schools, universities of Kansas, Missouri at Kansas City and South Dakota, and has received five NIH grants to study omega-3. He was the co-author on three AHA statements on fatty acids and heart health, and as the co-inventor of the omega-3 index and other omega-3 blood tests and founder of Omega Quant Analytics, Dr. Harris has been ranked among the top 2% of scientists worldwide based on the impact of his research. So some of the things you're going to learn in this episode, looking at levels of omega-6 fatty acids in the blood can predict future diseases like heart disease and diabetes. Higher levels of linoleic acid in the blood are associated with lower risk for these diseases. Increasing your levels of omega-3 is more important than worrying about getting your omega-6 levels down in order to have a good ratio between the two. It's also important to focus on EPA and DHA when it comes to types of omega-3s, and we're going to talk about those. It's important to measure your omega-3 levels. These levels are predictive of good health outcomes and even cholesterol levels. Oily fish like salmon and mackerel are amazing sources of omega-3s. Now, if you want to go get your omega-3 levels tested, Omega Quant's given us a great offer. You can use this URL, omegaquant.com forward slash ref forward slash NAT5 and use code NAT5 to save 5% off any test on their site. And they have some great tests. They have a really simple omega-3 test that you can you can use just to test your omega-3 levels. Cheap and cheerful. I think it's about 50, to, just under $50, but they've got a complete omega test. And there's also a vitamin D test. There's all kinds of really cool tests that you can go with there if you're looking to deep dive into your health. You can go to omegaquant.com, just the website, and there's tons of research, lots of great articles in there as well. And of course, you're going to want to follow them on Instagram at omega3index. All right. If you're looking to connect with me, if you have any questions for me after this episode, of course, the best place to really ask me questions is in my new membership community, the BSP community on Mighty Networks. And the way you find out about that and how to join is you go to my website, natnidham.com. And that's where at the top, you'll see a tab, BSP community, and you can learn all about what being a member of this community um, brings you including if you join up as an annual member, you get access to my peptide crash course 1.0 and the soon to be released 2.0. You will also get to learn on my website about my upcoming Women's Longevity and Resilience Retreat that's coming up November 1st to 6th in beautiful Cabarete in the Dominican Republic. We only have 10 spots left. We only have 10 spots, period, available. So if you're even remotely interested, you're going to want to check that out. You can also sign up for my newsletter, which is a great way of keeping track of latest nudes on peptides, latest podcasts, and also where I'm going to be next and where we can maybe meet up. And last but not least, there's, of course, the Facebook group, the Optimizing Superhuman Performance Group, which is uh, a great community, wild and woolly. It's really big uh, and lots of fun in there. Lots of great people. All right. If you get value from this episode, please make sure to share it out with family, friends, and networks. And if you're feeling inspired after today's episode, please do leave us a review because it's those reviews that allows us to rise up the ranks, get seen by more people, and makes it easier for me to get amazing guests for you guys. All right, enough of all this. 
Let's dive in and let's learn about omegas. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome to the show, Dr. William Harris. It is a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks for inviting me. Well, how could I not? I uh, ran into, who did I meet? I think it was Tavis. And he got to talking (laughs) to me about um, the Omega Quant test. And I remember saying, oh, wait, I need to test my Omega-3s because I'm all over the map with taking Omega-3. And so... um, so anyway, we got to talking and I ended up doing the the Omega Quant test, which came back, you know, pretty good, not great, but consistent with my attitude. So um, then pretty I Pretty average, decided, as I recall. Yeah. yeah, pretty average. And But average is in this world where people are so low is not a bad thing. Um, could be better. And it gives me something to shoot for. This is a good thing. Anyway, so then we got to talking. I said, okay, I need Dr. Harris on this podcast so that we can- you know, it's it's there's so many um, contradictions in the market right now about omega three supplementation that, um, and then omega the bigger topic of omega six versus omega three that we were talking about before recording. I just think it's it's such a it's such a great thing to be able to have someone like you on the show to kind of get bust through some myths, talk about some of the clinical evidence, and bring a little more nuance to the conversation. Well, I appreciate it. I think there is a lot of confusion. And if if we can bring some more light to it, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as you know, I mean, I think that for the most part, people are well-meaning, but we're always trying in the in an effort to make things more accessible to the lay person, as you were talking about earlier, things just get grossly oversimplified to the point where now they're just wrong. So, for example, (laughs) and I mean, this is a weird place to start, but this narrative that um, if you take omega-3, it's going to thin your blood and make you it make it easier for you to bleed, where you were just saying that actually from an evidence perspective, that it's not supported particularly, which is not to say that people should ignore their surgeon's recommendations to take their to stop taking their omega-3s before surgery, because you know, we're we're not going to go there, but maybe you can yeah. talk a little bit about this whole idea of the effect and and you know we're really jumping ahead here because we're going to talk about omega 3s and cell membranes and all that kind of stuff but you know just because nobody else would start here we could we could just talk a little <laughs> bit about omega 3s and it's their effect on blood clotting and and blood circulation that kind of thing sure yeah and that's a actually that's where the whole omega 3 story started in the Greenland Eskimos in the 1970s was about bleeding Oh, well, there That's you go. It began. So you were right on target, right on target. Okay. Um, and, and you mentioned membranes. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the there's the cell that we have in our blood that's primarily responsible for stopping us from bleeding when we get a cut. It's called a platelet. And the platelets are little um, membranes. They have, And then if you got omega-3s in the membranes, the platelets are less sticky. They're less likely to particularly form a clot when they're not supposed to form a clot. That's what you don't want. No. Um, and so pe- people use the term uh, blood thinning. Uh, it's it's not literally true. Your blood is not actually more vis- or less viscous. Uh, it's just less likely to clot. Um, and I think it became kind of a colloquialism among uh, doctors talking to patients, particularly when they're talking about aspirin. What does aspirin do for me, doc? Well, it thins your blood. Well, it's, it does the same way omega-3s do. It doesn't really thin it. It just makes your, your platelets less likely to get sticky yeah. and uh, form a clot where you shouldn't have one. Yeah, which in general is it's, a good thing. It's um, a good thing. It's so good actually, thing. let me ask you a question. In the current world where after the last couple of years, there's a lot of discussion around microclots, like a lot of, you know, uh, following the pandemic, I mean, COVID-19, the spike protein, the the prevalence of, of excess clotting that is being seen. Do you think that, have you thought about, or has anybody looked into whether or not somebody's omega-3 status might make them more or less prone to that? Or do you think 
that whatever it is that this virus is doing supersedes omega-3 status? Does, has anybody even looked at that? Do you know? I don't think anybody's looked at it. It's a great question. Um, I'm glad you raised it. Or maybe we'll think about how we could study that. But I mean, we've looked at omega-3 levels as they relate to for COVID. Yeah. Per se. And, and hospitalization for COVID and death from COVID. Uh, and higher omega-3 levels uh, uniformly associated with less less likely being hospitalized with COVID, less likely to die from COVID, and actually even less likely to get test to test positive for COVID, which is really kind of an interesting thing. Yeah, it's not that sort of surprised me when we saw that uh, because I thought you know the omega-3s would be there to be anti-inflammatory to uh, protect against the inflammatory. Uh, uh, stimulus of the of the virus in your lungs uh, and other tissues, and that made sense. Um, but to not even so, of course, testing positive means you're getting in, the virus in your in your blood or actually in your nose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that's where they tip, you know, that's where you find it. Uh, and to find that we, you're less likely to actually test positive, suggests that the omega threes might even block the replication of the virus in your tissues down. Uh, and there's some evidence for that. So it's 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 a good thing for COVID. Now whether it has any, if it's helpful for the micro bleeds or the uh, susceptibility to ex excessive clotting, I would think it would help. But I, nobody's tested it to my mind. Hmm. That would be a cool thing to look at, though, because it would be. You, you know, to you get the credit for the idea. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. They tell you to think of a good question. I got one. Okay, great. You got one. We, I, I can, I can, uh, I, I can. We'll put you on the paper. That. Um, okay, amazing. Well, in, inspiration provided by Nat. Um, it's about as far as it'll go. So let's now dial it back and move into the world of omega-3 and omega-6, because we can't talk about omega-3 without talking about omega-6. Um, and, you know, just like we were talking about earlier, where HDL has been labeled the good cholesterol and LDL, the bad cholesterol, which the truth of the matter is it's not nearly that simple. And LDL, again, we need LDL or there'd be nothing to carry the cholesterol to where it, away. Um, Omega-3s have been labeled the good omegas and omega-6 the bad. And we have different divisions. There's more nuance to the conversation. So maybe we could start with omega-6 and talking about the value of omega-6 because we would die without it, without any omega-6 in our system. We need certain types of omega-6 in certain ratios, and maybe that's where we could start. Yeah, and you're right. I, I don't think anybody would actually advocate for zero omega-6 in the diet. Um, that, I mean, omega-6, uh, we're talking about linoleic acid. It, it, that's the particular omega-6 fatty acid. It's the vast majority of what we eat in the diet is, omega is linoleic acid. And it's essentially a vitamin. Um, in, in the classic sense that you, we cannot make it, uh, we need it. Um, the question is how much we need. Yeah. And the, uh, th those who are anti omega six will say, well, maybe you need really, really little bit, just enough, just barely enough to get by. And others would say, no, you need a lot because it, you know, reduces risk for a variety of other diseases. Um, so the, the argument is a lot or a little is more than uh, yes or no. And the, the omega-6 is actually, um, the, basically from what we've seen in our research studies, which have been, uh, in the kind of studies we do, we look at levels of omega-6 fatty acids in the blood, and to the extent that predicts a future disease, mm -hmm. uh, like heart disease, like diabetes, things like this. And what we've seen is when we do these, do our studies, we uh, we pool data from, you know, 10 or 20 different trials. And we are, we look at blood levels of omega-6, linoleic acid. And then we ask after 15, 20 years of having levels this high, are you at higher risk for developing heart disease or diabetes or lower risk or unrelated? And it turns out that both for heart disease and for diabetes, higher levels of linoleic acid in the blood are associated with lower risk for those diseases. Hmm. So 
th that is very compelling evidence, in my view, that higher levels of omega-6 are good for you, higher than average, and reducing the amount of omega-6 intentionally in your diet so that your blood levels go down will, uh, at least in theory, should increase your risk for heart disease or diabetes. Um, if, if obviously if higher levels are better, lower levels are worse. Um, right. So I, I'm a fan of, I, I always see them as sort of partners in protection, omega-3 and omega-6. They're both good, um, which is why I'm not a big fan of this omega-6, omega-3 ratio, because that pre presupposes the black hat, white hat you're just talking about, the but good then, guy, the bad guy. But then wouldn't that just just so that's what i was going to ask you next like is it not then about the balance between omega-6 and omega-3 because the narr there's this narrative that the 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 conventional or the sad american diet right now like the standard american diet is so overweighted to omega-6 where people are walking around with ratios of like 40 to 1 or 20 to 1 whereas when you look at a at a population like in japan where, I mean, to look at a traditional Japanese diet, not, you know, your, your, yeah. your modern day Jap Japanese person right, who's adopted right. North American standards of eating and, you, you know, you toss fish it, to, right. the, to the wind. But in a, but in a traditional Japanese uh, population that eat a lot of fish, like on a daily basis kind of thing, you would see ratios closer to maybe four to one or maybe as low as two to one of omega-6 to omega-3. And <clears throat> I believe that they have much better longevity, lower levels. And I remember doing a project on this in school that they had much lower levels of depression and anxiety, like better cognitive function. So to say that omega-6 isn't bad is one thing, but then do we not then need to refine the conversation to talk about that, to talk about the ratio of omega-6 and omega-3? Because if you're just so grossly overrepresented on omega-6, it's setting you up. There's about 27 questions in there. So I'm letting, I'm going to let there you are. rip now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, as with any ratio, simple math will tell you, it, is it the numerator or is it the not denominator? That's the problem. Yeah. yeah. And in Japan, this is a story you just told is exactly right. You know, the traditional Japanese diet is associated with high fish intake and a great uh, and increased longevity, a lot of good things, less heart disease, et cetera. Um, but that's because they eat a lot of omega-3. It's not because they're avoiding omega-6. It's because they eat a lot of omega-3. Right. And there's your ratio. I mean, you can fix a ratio by increasing the denominator or decreasing the numerator. And which way, I and mean, that's part of the confusion. Right. Uh, I think with this ratio is just because you've got a bad ratio doesn't mean you have too much omega-6. It could mean you have too little omega-3. Right. And that's easier to attack. You don't have to change the omega-6 to improve the ratio. You just take more omega-3. Right. Get, well, although more... unless if you're really like pounding the omega-6 and taking omega-3, it just yeah. might be harder to, to influence the ratio. I mean, you know, we're splitting hairs at this point, but the bottom yeah, line is <laughs> you can't improve uh, your omega-3 by decreasing omega-6 unless you're improving omega-3. You, you cannot. Right. You do not improve <laughs> your your omega-3 status by lowering your omega-6 level. Exactly. If, if you don't have enough omega-3 to begin with. No, you're not going to make you're not going to make omega threes out of omega sixes for sure. Okay, uh, and yeah, part of the problem with that ratio is it just says omega three and omega six, and we know there are multiple fatty acids in the omega three family that are the ALA from plants versus EPA and DHA from marine sources. They're different metabolically. They're different actions. So to pull pull them together and say they're all omega threes, ah, they're all the same thing, and they say do the same thing with omega six. You know, linoleic acid, arachidonic acid they behave differently and to pull them all together. You don't know which, which is what's you know, doing what, which is which you just throw in this, a big omega six, omega three. It's just much too imprecise. Okay. Perfect segue. Let's dive Good. into the omega threes. Mm. So soon. <laughs> Just getting well, started on omega six. That's okay. Let's okay go or, omega no, well, we can start with omega. Actually, maybe we should start with omega six because once we go to omega three, we'll probably never come back to omega six. So you right, just right. noticed you just you just mentioned two different omega sixes, and I know there's mm -hmm. more, 
But the two big mm-hmm. players that people might have heard about is the linoleic acid and the ar- arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid has that thing that it drives inflammation. But frankly, we need that inflammation to a degree to heal. But right. again, we're right. lacking nuance. So I'm going to let you, the expert, go at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And, uh, you know, people will say, oh, the, if you, the more linoleic acid you eat, the more arachidonic acid you'll have because it's arachidonic can be made from linoleic acid. It's a longer chain, more complicated molecule than linoleic. But when you actually look at the studies that have varied the amount of linoleic acid in the diet, either going, taking it away or just loading up, and then looking at the effects of that change in linoleic acid on plasma levels of arachidonic acid, Mm -hmm. doesn't make any difference. (laughs) The body just regulates it. It's just flat. You can take linoleic away for two months or you can get, you can add triple the amount for two months and the blood levels of arachidonic don't change. So it's not the, the, the idea that you're by taking linoleic, you're driving this train, this pro-inflammatory train headed up by arachidonic acid. It's just not, the evidence just isn't there for that, in my opinion. Right. Um, so the, uh, you know, the, I, I guess the only other problem I have with that ratio, which I can't seem to stop talking about. Um, <laughs> well, it's, is in that you re- can have- it's, it's in your report. Well, no, it's AA no, to I EPA, know. not AA to omega-3. So we'll talk about why you do have that in there. Well, yeah, right, right. But the, th- the thing is you can have a high level of omega-6 and a high level of omega-3 or a really, really low level of omega-6 and a low level omega-3 and same ratio. Yeah, right, right. So- Ratios, right. come on, throw them, throw them away. Um, yeah, in the report at Omega Quant, we do have uh, our primary report is about the omega three index. Yeah, which is you know EPA and DHA and red cell membranes. That I think is the most important thing. That's mm-hmm. the easiest easiest to change. Most you can laser focus on getting more EPA and DHA in. We also provide. Because people want to know, <laughs> I wish they didn't. <laughs> they want to know what's my ratio. Well, okay, here's your ratio. Do with it what you want, you know. But th- the way to fix your ratio, if you're concerned about your ratio, is to get more omega three. Yeah. Don't worry about the omega six stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's That's interesting my... because looking at mine, right? So my omega three, I'm at about five and a half percent, which is yeah. kind of okay. Like it's not yeah. perfect, but it's it's okay. It's... But my my yeah. ratio of omega six to omega three is five point one, which is again kind of on the a- edge of okay to to where. But but to your point, I could improve that ratio and still be low in omega three. You you could theoretically in theory, um, right? What I really want to do is crank sorry, up my omega three. Right, that's what you want to do: is crank up your omega three, and that will improve quote quote all the things ratios. Yeah. All the all the things. Okay, so let's get it's back a, to it's our a simple omega- message. Yeah, yeah. Go so ahead. Let's get back to our omega six discussion about arachidonic acid, linoleic acid, um, what they really do, and where do we get them from in the diet? And you know, it seems to me they come from a lot of healthy foods. Does it make a difference where you're getting it from? Like, is there an unhealthy source and a healthy source? What's what are your thoughts on that? Well, and we're talking about. It's kind of like the omega-3 story. Linoleic acid it comes from plants. Yeah, it's typically, in our diets, seed oils. Yeah. Soy, soybean oil is the primary one that gives us the most linoleic acid in our diet. And then there's corn oil and other vegetable oils. Uh, canola and, and olive don't have very much linoleic in them. Um, <clears throat> so that's a plant-based thing. Arachidonic does not come from plants. It only comes from animals. In the same way that EPA and DHA only come from an animal, i.e. a fish, uh, and alpha-linolenic acid, the short-chain omega-3, comes from plants. So there's a real parallel between the two families of omega-6 and omega-3. And the longer-chain ones come from animals, the shorter-chain ones come from plants. Um, Arachidonic, you... We only eat on average about 100 milligrams a day of arachidonic acid in America, as opposed to 16,000 milligrams a day of 
linoleic acid. Interesting. So, I mean, the vast majority of the omega-6 we eat is linoleic acid. And you get arachidonate from meat, from eggs, animal foods. That's that's the, the animal will make and put it in their tissues. Right. Uh, and, and and we do the same as, as uh, humans. And if we eat more arachidonic acid, do we know that our blood levels will go up is, or is it similar to... Um, what you were saying earlier. Yes. Yeah. You will, you'll raise your blood levels if you eat, if, if you try to eat more arachidonic acid and nobody's selling arachidonic acid supplements. You probably no. noticed that. No. no, there's no point. <laughs> we, there's no point in doing that. Um, in fact, they're not selling linoleic acid supplements either. Well, although some people do these total omega silly yeah. things and put six, omega-3, omega-9, omega-75, whatever omega they can think of, and they throw it in a pill. And, you know, anyway, we're going to get tough supplements later, I think. Well, omega-9 we can make, right? Which is interesting. Mm -hmm. we, we can actually yeah, manufacture it, it. That doesn't stop people from selling it in bottles. No, I know. No, very mm -hmm. little stops people <laughs> from selling anything in bottles. All right. So <laughs> our omega-6 story is we need them we yeah. get them we get plenty from our diet it's you're never you're unlikely to become deficient in omega-6 from your diet from imp i mean how could you possibly True. become omega-6 deficient from a diet like what would you have to be eating you, yeah it's almost impossible if you're eating food uh, <laughs> the only way it's been discovered is people who are on uh tube feeding or mm -hmm. intravenous feeding when they didn't give them any omega-6 in the intravenous feed. Right. And that's where they discovered the deficiency, actually. People got Interesting. scaly skin and other deficiency symptoms. Okay, so that's that's actually a really good point. So how what are the signs and symptoms of omega-6 deficiency? Scaly skin. That's that's primarily. Yeah, Just, scaly skin and actually it's um, water loss. People with the skin also loses its ability to hold water. Really? And yeah, because omega sixes are needed for some of the skin lipids that form the barrier, um, and and then if you have eventually, um, those I mean those are the classic symptoms of omega six deficiency, and so you just you just don't see it outside of a tube feeding situation or or total parenteral nutrition where everything is given by V. Right. People have a, a, a gut that doesn't work. Right. Right. Uh, so very right. very rare. Right. Or the other rare instance would be these people who, I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of these people who are morbidly obese and actually go on these medical fasts that go for months and months. Um, but they're supplement, they're almost always supplementing them with vitamins, minerals. And I wonder if they're also supplementing with the omegas in those. They instances. could be. Um, there's a, in those folks, there's a lot of, I mean, if they, if they got their excess S excess fat honestly just by eating a lot not exercising very much there's probably a lot of little lake acid in their adipose tissue right and right. it will it will come out as needed uh so the, they'll probably have to supplement with little lake acid in that setting um, right you, you've, you've got a well anyway we're going to get too far in the weeds on that <laughs> yeah. how, yeah, how you deal with total parenteral nutrition <laughs> Okay, no, that's not the topic. But that's that's maybe for that's another, not the topic. topic another time. Uh, for All another right. day. All right. Is there anything else we need to say about omega six, or are we ready to move on to omega three? Well, I just I just want the take home message to be: don't be afraid of omega six fatty acids. Perfect. And, and don't go out of your way to avoid them or consume them. Uh, right, right. Do eat them. Eat them. Don't yeah, you know use don't, don't salad dressings. Don't don't freak out. Soybean oil is not the devil. It's fine. Well, I think it's yeah, helpful. I think there's other reasons why soybean oil might not be great, but I I also think in a world where we're under we're under consuming omega threes, over consuming too many of the seed oils, it just emphasizes that that despair that gap. Yeah, maybe, but the, the, again, the problem again, the problem to me is the lack of omega three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's what you want to focus on. Okay, cool. And I mean, we can, we could actually talk about the little Ellen, the little baby pink elephant in the room here when we bring up soybean <laughs> and corn oil and all those things, which what people freak out about. I mean, one of the things that people, you know, that, that has been highlighted with those food, those foods or those crops is this whole issue of genetically modified 
crops which have been genetically modified in order to be able to be sprayed and oh, survive yeah, sure. the spray, right? The whole, the whole and, round roundup stuff. Exactly. And I think that's where we start to, well, we're not even on a slippery slope at this point. We've fallen into a bad place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. That gets away from the omega-6 story per se. It though. does. It does. But, but I mean, you know, your sourcing has everything to do and we'll talk about it for fish as well. So, okay. So let's yeah. move over to omega-3. So your takeaway guys for omega-6 is don't be afraid of omega-6. Um, you don't need to avoid it. You don't need to focus on it either because as long as you're eating food, you're most likely you're getting what you need where we're going to yeah. turn our attention and spend more time speaking now is on the omega-3 story. So let's, right. let's kind of break it down into our components here. Okay. The omega-3s. Well, yes. we mentioned them earlier. There's kind of two general omega-3 um, fatty acid groups. One is alpha linolenic acid from uh, which we get from plant oil. Also soybean oil is also our major source of alpha linolenic acid. Um, and that is an 18 carbon chain just to, to, uh, with three double bonds in it. It's, and it's called so 18,3 omega-3, alpha linolenic. And that one, um, we eat probably uh, 1,500, 1,600 milligrams a day on average of that stuff we get in the American diet. Right. Uh, compared to about 100 milligrams a day. So one sixteenth as much um, EPA, DHA, the two that we get from fish, marine sources. Um, and there's very little conversion. There's some conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA in the human body, but mm -hmm. it's minimal. Um, it's still controversial whether, well, I, I mean, I think we have to say ALA is probably the essential omega-3 fatty acid compared to EPA and DHA, which are desirable, but they're not essential. I mean, if you look at a vegan diet, there are, there are cultures that are completely vegan. How many? That eat no, Not that many. No animal. Well, maybe India. I mean, you think I think about some Hindu uh, cultures where meat of any kind is verboten. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't get you you do not get any preformed arachidonic acid on the omega six side or any preformed EPA and D omega three side. And yet these people can grow, have babies, you know, and be generally healthy. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, you you can live. Without yeah. eating EPA and DHA. You can is live without eating arachidone. Yeah. Is it possible that in those population, and I, this is just a question, like, is it possible that in those, in those uh, cultures or those populations, because they've been this way for generations upon generations upon generations, is it possible that their bodies have somehow adapted to convert the plant-based omegas into what the body needs at a higher rate than... It's, it's, it's a, good, it's a great be. question. And I don't think I've ever seen a study that's tested that question. Uh, it's, it's a good idea. And it, and you certainly could theoretically, uh, you know, like give some label to rec ALA to somebody and see how much of it gets converted to EPA and DHA in a long-term vegan and a long-term omnivore and see if the, there's a difference. Yeah. That's, 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 the, that's a good study. We'll do that. No, we okay, won't good. do that. That's number uh, some two. people could do that. Number two. Num number two. We don't know about number one yet. <laughs> we haven't <laughs> talked about number one yet, though. No, no, but that's my second idea. My first idea was if 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 omega three status impacts micro clotting issues in COVID nineteen patients. This oh, is my second true. idea. <laughs> I wouldn't. I I remember that. That's true. Okay, good. All right. So better, I'm going to okay, make well, a list. But that is but that is interesting because I think that quite. I mean, as a nutritionist, I will have seen. A lot of vegans that come to me that are not doing well, they're depleted. Um, mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. they have a lot of issues with depression. They have a lot of issues with inflammation. And in those cases, and I mean, you can't point to one thing as being the reason right. why. I mean, maybe you could, but you'd have to do extensive testing. But, right. you know, there is a narrative out there that says that completely shunning animal foods if we're not supplementing properly around it can leave us depleted in certain areas. And the omega threes might be one of those areas. 
Yeah, I mean, no, I absolutely DHA agree. Anyway, could be one of those areas. Yeah, absolutely agree. Yeah, that's right. Okay. You know, I, I think yeah, I would go along with that. Cool. Well, I'm honored. All right. So you, let's you'll uh, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So our, for the most part, for most people, that conversion of the plant um, omega-3 to the EPA DHA is going to be minimal. It's going to be hard to meet our needs from like your flax seeds and your sunflower, like all the different seeds that you're going to get mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that plant-based omega-3 right. from. Um, and then on the EPA DHA- or One thing more I should say about that is say, those yeah. who are anti-omega-6 will- I can see them over there saying, yeah, but Bill, if they <clears throat> if they cut back on their omega-6, then they would convert more of the ALA to EPA and DHA because there's less competition from the omega-6. Still not enough. And I'll say, <laughs> still not enough. And I'll still say, well, when they've done that in experiments in humans, the yeah, you, the EPA level goes up when you've dropped the omega-6 conversion to EPA, but the DHA level goes down. So your EPA plus DHA stays the same. It just is not going to help. All right. Well, then now so let's it, talk it, about it's, EPA. It's complicated. And yeah, it is complicated. Okay. And, okay. And, and I think it bears mentioning that it's complicated and it's not that simple, right? So right. now let's right. talk about EPA and DHA and how they're different. Because we know DHA, critical for the brain. What about EPA? Mm -hmm. And let's talk about those two how they're different and the same and all that stuff. And now we're right, looking for right. a ratio so the, there or not. No, I, I don't think we're looking for a ratio. I mean, maybe, okay. maybe someday somebody will figure that out, but I don't have, don't see any good evidence for it yet. Um, we've, we've got good evidence to giving DHA does good thing for inflammation and for blood lipid levels and for platelet function and exactly the same thing for EPA. They do. They have very similar actions across a variety of systems. Um, they produce different uh, different downstream chemicals. We call um, oxylipins or SPMs, mm -hmm. uh, special uh, mediators of, of, of resolution. Um, but at this point, the way I see it, you need both EPA and DHA. That's the way they're in nature. Mm -hmm. Fish, whenever you get them in fish, they're always together. Some fish are richer in DHA, some fish are richer in EPA, but it's roughly, you know, three to one, one to three, 50, 50 um, in that, in that ballpark. And that's the way I think uh, people ought to think about supplementing uh, is don't, don't get something that's just rich in DHA and no EPA or vice versa. Okay. Get now both. there is an omega-3 drug that's EPA only, but we'll probably talk about that later. Well, we can talk about it whenever you want. So whenever you're, I'm, you know, I think, you know, the EPA DHA story is an interesting story. So how are they, how are they different? Do we know? Oh, well, chemically, we know they're different. Yeah. DHA is a simply a, a different, a longer, bigger molecule. It's got six double bonds in it and 22 carbons, as opposed to EPA, which has five double bonds and 20 carbons. And most people are going, well, so what? Right. Well, yeah. To the body and a lot of enzymes, it makes it, it's a so what to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, devil is in the details. <laughs> the devil's in the details. And so they are different that way. Uh, we do not accumulate EPA in our brain tissue, but we accumulate a lot of DHA in our brain tissue. So that there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure anybody really knows what it is, but we know it doesn't happen without a reason. No. <laughs> there's a purpose yeah. for everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean EPA has nothing to do with the brain because EPA also has anti-inflammatory properties. And there's a lot of blood that circulates through capillaries in the brain. And if that's carrying EPA in it, even if the EPA doesn't cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain tissue, it's circulating in your head. Uh, and so having EPA in higher levels, uh, actually, it's been associated with less risk for uh, or more effective reduction in depression symptoms. Um, EPA has. Several, EPA, yeah. Hmm. When people have done, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, they're doing a lot of depression studies with EPA and DHA. Yeah. And they were using different different formulations. And everybody thought, well, DHA is in the brain, so we got to give DHA and that'll affect, that'll improve brain health. It turned out that 
didn't really help, didn't hurt, but didn't really help. Um, the products that seemed to be symptomatically helpful in depression were richer in EPA than DHA. They weren't pure EPA, but they were richer in EPA than DHA. So that kind of gave people, a little, well, wow, EPA may be doing something, um, even if it's not actually part of the brain tissue, because the DHA is definitely part of the brain tissue. And so is there a difference in function between EPA and DHA? Like, is one of them more anti-inflammatory than the other? Because I'm wondering, you not, know, could inflammation be the problem or? Well, not really. Uh, when people have done studies where they just give pure EPA and they give pure DHA to the same people, you know, obviously separated in time <coughs> and, look, Excuse me. and look at the look at the effects on inflammatory markers in the blood and look at the effects on um, lipids, ser- serum lipids, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, et cetera. Uh, they both are, are effective. Actually, DHA is a little more effective in lowering some of the inflammatory markers. Now, the thing is, we're not measuring every inflammatory marker known to God. I mean, well, no. we, we only measure the ones them, known to us. Probably, <laughs> yeah. We only measure the ones, and even then, we only measure you know, you know, four or five out of the five hundred that are probably there. So we don't really know everything that's going on. You know, it's all mm-hmm. dark on the inside. In case anybody doesn't know that, we really can't see what's happening. Um, and so, yeah, how are they different? Uh, they they make different, uh, you know. In the platelet, they make the EPA makes a different anti-platelet uh, molecule than DHA does, but they're both effective in reducing platelet stickiness. Yeah. They both lower lipids. Um, so it's it's a it's, it's really unclear. So obviously, I'm having a hard time explaining what the difference is because I don't think we really know. Other no, than, that's a that's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> like at the we end don't of the know. day, so that's why I say take them take, take them together. Like take them both, and I mean the we the. Need both of them. The the logic of that's the way they occur in nature is a very powerful one because it's kind of a nod that says, you know, for all the things we don't know, if we respect nature, yeah, we probably can't go wrong. <laughs> You're right. It's it's a good bet that there's something right about it. Yeah. 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 So in terms of sourcing these things, or is there any, where else do you want to go with this, with the EPA, DHA? I mean, the DHA, very rich in, I mean, it's rich in mother's milk, right, for for newborns? Yeah, right, compared to EPA. It was very, not much EPA at all in mother's milk. Um, it, DHA, it's about, well, it's hard to say what rich means. 0.3% of the fatty acids mm-hmm. are DHA. That's considered worldwide average. Uh, and it's a reasonable target. Right. Um, and does the mother's yeah. nutrition affect that? Yes, totally. Okay. Mother's the mother's DHA intake is really strongly de- de- uh, determines breast milk DHA levels. Okay. And so if you want your baby to have more DHA in their brains while you're nursing, then you need to be taking DHA as mom. Yeah. Well, and which... take it during all during pregnancy. I mean, not just during lactation. Well, I actually think that's really important. Point. And I think people, people often think about, you know, what am I eating while I'm nursing? What am I feeding my baby once they're, my baby's born? And sometimes we forget that, well, I mean, I don't know how much we forget, but maybe there's, and people take prenatal vitamins, but will prenatal vitamins be enough? Or is there an argument to be made for prenatal vitamins are great. And when it comes to omega-3, omegas, a good omega supplement on top of that is probably a great idea. Um, yes, agreed, agreed. For- and most recently that's been demonstrated in uh, when looking at um, the end point of uh, premature delivery. So that is to say moms who are getting more DHA and, and have blood levels above a certain level uh, are less likely to develop or to uh, deliver prematurely, especially very early prematurely i mean there there's premature birth and there's then there's a very premature birth so what's very premature uh, like in your books 20 34 weeks before 34 weeks before 37 weeks is kind of premature then early early preterm delivery is below yeah. 34 weeks having had a 28 week old baby i can tell you that Ooh, when yeah. people tell me their baby was premature at 34 weeks i laugh mm. in their general direction 
Those are the babies that hit the NICU that we look at and go, it's a monster. Like what's that, what's that thing doing in here? A 20 week, 28 week. Oh my. Yeah. Turned out. Okay. Turned out to be a rock star. So we got, we, we got really lucky. Rock star. Literally. Um, not in the music commercials? world, but you know, uh, okay. in right. the achievement okay. world, he's uh, he's uh, he's doing all right. Great, great. <laughs> yeah, no, we got we got very lucky on that front. But but to your point, you know, and I mean, there's so many different factors, and I would say, who knows? You know, maybe my omega status. I mean, for me, it was preeclampsia, which is a whole different kettle of fish. Oh, um, <laughs> it's it's a whole other. Right. Right. That's very complicated. We don't, we don't need to go down yeah. that hole, but um, but let's get back to so let's get back to our story with DHA APA. So super important during all phases of life. Um, I wanted to talk. I mean, I'm always wanting to talk about longevity and really this idea of health span, right? Mm-hmm. Which is yeah. you know as we live longer, which is super awesome. I you know. I'm at that stage of life where I have a lot of friends who have parents living really not very fulfilling lives in institutions. And I think that as we see our ability to remain alive extend, particularly in certain cultures in, in North America and you know where we have this luxury of living a very long time, what we're not necess- what we want to make sure is that we're ensuring that we're going to live well and be have our wits about us and remain mobile in the whole nine yards. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about the role that these omegas, whether it's six and three and and that whole kind of sector plays on that in terms of what we know and what we are still learning about. Yeah. And we can talk mostly about omega three in that in that regard because Studies really haven't looked at the relationship between omega six levels and longevity, yeah, and frailty, uh, and uh, bone break, and things like that. But they have looked at omega three. Okay, um, we have, uh, we and others have looked at higher levels. Uh, and, and again, the kind of studies we do, we look, we look at uh, large populations uh, where we have, we know the blood level of the omega three fatty acids, EPA, DHA. And we then we can rank people from the highest to the lowest. Yeah. And then we can ask the question if, after 10, 15, 20 years of living like that, uh, who's alive and who's dead? Easy one. Yeah. That's a hard, not a hard one to adjudicate. No. Um, who has a heart attack? Who doesn't? Who Another has one. dementia? Who doesn't? That's that's tougher. You know, dementia is hard to, well, anyway. <laughs> But, but that's the one amorphous we want, concepts, that's, but yes. <laughs> that's the one we that's the one we want to avoid, you know. People don't worry about their heart anymore. Ah, eh, they'll fix it. The doctor can fix that. Except for know. a sudden cardiac death, right? Yeah. Other yeah. But uh in each case, the people that have the highest omega-3 levels, and then we're talking levels of you know, six, seven, eight percent. We we like to see over eight percent as our target. We think that's optimal. And when we look at these studies, we see the people that are roughly in the, the highest quintile, which is the highest 20% of the population, mm-hmm. um, they do the best. Mm. And they have, and their average omega-3 index is about, in this last study, about 7.8. Okay. Wow. 8%. Okay. It's a good, it's a good target. Uh, it's, it's a Japanese level target. Okay. That's where the, the, the traditional Japanese diet. Oh, actually, about nine, nine or ten percent traditional Japanese diet, um, and that may be responsible for the greater longevity in Japan. I mean, hate to pin it on one thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's Japanese probably live... it's probably one of the factors, right? I mean, there's. Yeah, I think it's one of the factors because I mean they live about four and a half years longer than the average American does, and they smoke more than we do. That ain't going to help, and they have more high blood pressure than we do. And that's not going to help. Still, they live longer. They are higher stress levels, you know, but they still live longer than we do. Uh, so they got some strikes against them uh, from those other risk factors. Mm-hmm. That I think the omega-3 may be really helping them through that, but th- that's a study no one's ever going to do. 
Well, um, it's interesting on the omega-3 side because, you know, you wonder with the higher blood pressure, if you had higher omega-3 levels and could the omega-3 kind of mitigate some of the traditional issues that you see with high blood pressure? I mean, I, I don't know where it was, but I heard someone speaking recently about, you know, that that high blood pressure may not be as bad as people think in certain settings. And, you know, high being... I don't know how high they were talking, obviously. Right, right, not, right. Not 220 over 180 where I was one Dude. day. Oh, God. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. That's your preeclampsia? Oh, my God. Yeah. Holy it, smokes. Yeah, it was yeah. a ride and a half, let me tell you. Um, but, um, but, but, but slightly higher, could it be that higher omega-3 levels kind of again, because the, pl- the blood's not as sticky, could it be that it's kind of helping to mitigate in those populations, some of the downfalls of having high blood pressure. I mean, it's a completely theoretical question and nobody's yeah, got the answer to it, but it but it would be an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and certainly omega, higher omega-3 levels do improve uh, blood vessel health. Yeah. Writ large. Um, and so if the, the pressure inside the vessel is is higher than usual, the, the vessel should be able to handle it better. Exactly. If the omega-3s are in the, the, the uh, cellular membranes of the vessels. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I think, I mean, again, what that points to a little bit is how much more nuanced the conversation can get Yeah. when you start to really right. look at the little bits and pieces, right? Because if you have yes. higher blood ves- blood pressure in a vessel that's still supple and elastic and able to give and take, mm-hmm. um, yeah. could it be that it's maybe not as bad for the person as a stiff blood vessel that just can't accommodate? Yeah. Right. Right. right? So anyway, yep. so- do we have anything more there or am I going to move on to my fish questions? Around? Move on to your fish. Okay, let's, let's on move to on to fish and sources of omega-3. So I listened to another one of your podcasts and I also learned in school that the reason why fish is so high in omega-3 and why we eat fish is because the fish are eating algae and they're basically bioaccumulating the EPA, DHA from the, the algae. And then we eat the fish and we get the EPA, DHA from the fish. Um And, you know, I've always been of the opinion, get your, get your supplements from food whenever possible. But I think that these days fish is becoming more problematic because the ocean's becoming more problematic. And, you know, we're getting into this world of the conversation around microplastics and never mind the whole mercury issue, which I know some people, you know, there's, there's someone I would, I learned from who talks about a real, you know, if you look at us at the, at the amount of selenium in a fish, it's going to offset the mercury and be protective in essence. So the mercury conversation is, is a different conversation, but there's lots of other nasty stuff in the ocean right now. That's bio, that is this soup that fish are living in. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and as much as people don't like to hear it, that's one of the arguments for aquaculture where you control (laughs) You, yeah. you don't just let them swim free. You control exactly what they eat and what their environment is to a large extent. Um, and you a- avoid levels of pollutants that you might normally get in native ocean. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and that's a complicated, they're all complicated stories, but there's really only, a f- there's not that many fish that are really rich in omega-3. Yeah. So let's talk about that. There's herring. It's a very few. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, though there's herring. I think we the the acronym is SMASH, um, S for either salmon or sardine. Yeah, I'll start with salmon since that's the most you know one of the best. Salmon A anchovies. O oh, M excuse me mackerel A anchovies, S sardine H herring. So those five fish really and, and albacore tuna is is pretty is quite good in omega three. Oh, that's tuna. interesting. That's yeah. interesting because tuna not is supposed the, to be quite pink. lean. Yeah. But the albacore has got higher, certainly twice as much omega-3 per, per serving as chunk light or chunk pink tuna. Okay. Um, it's, it's more expensive too. Mm-hmm. It tastes better. Uh, but those are, you know, that's it. I mean, they're, we're not talking about tilapia, orange roughy, uh, no. you know, any number cod. of white fish that have very yeah. cod that have very little omega-3 in their tissues because you know cod for example is the classic example of 
where it's a species of fish that stores oil, not in their tissues, not in their muscle, like salmon does. It stores oil in their liver. Ah, good Hence segue. cod liver oil. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, it, you know, the, if you're, unless you're eating the liver of a cod, which has got lots of omega-3 in it, um, what you're eating the flesh is, you know, I mean, it's, it's better than a hot dog. Okay. But it's <laughs> not, not a great much. source of omega-3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's tip, yeah, tilapia, for example, almost no omega-3 in tilapia, Yeah, which is why people like it. It tastes, you know, it tastes like chicken. Yeah. The thing with tilapia, I think tilapia is a fish that um, where aquaculture has got is given aquaculture a really bad name, right? Because the way that yeah. tilapia is raised is, and, and, you know, it, it, we were talking about GMOs earlier, and I think this is not a bad place to kind of talk about that a little bit where, again, aquaculture, good or bad, GMO, good or bad. And, the, and the truth yeah. is they can be either, right? I've started right. personally looking at when I'm shopping for fish, I've started looking not necessarily turning my back on farm fish, but asking the question, how are they being farmed? What are they being fed? Because there's good aquaculture and there's going to be bad aquaculture. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it gets tough for the consumer mm -hmm. to know, um, which and that's part of the reason that dietary supplements are easier to take. They're cheaper. Fish. I, I agree with you that, Get your nutrients from food, not mm -hmm. supplements, if you can. But sometimes you can't, and sometimes you won't. Yeah. In North America, uh, you're in Canada, I'm in the U.S., we, at least in the Midwest, we don't like fish. We don't grow up with fish. We don't yeah. like the taste of fish. And if we don't like the taste, we ain't going to eat it. No. Yeah. yeah. I don't care how good it is for me. Um Absolutely. And so how do you, you know, how do you get around that? You say, well, you just throw your hands up and say, okay, then just don't have any omega-3s. No, that's not a good solution. Mm -mm. There's supplements. Then you can take them. Yeah, so. for sure. And, um, and so, and so the omega-3 drugs versus supplement question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drug. Well, right. And they're drugs, not because of their the, the chemical composition, the actual molecule, right? Yeah. In a supplement and in a drug, it's the same thing. Yeah. By and large. Yeah. By and large. Um, it, they're drugs simply because a drug company went to the trouble of putting them in a pill. Nothing novel about that. No. But doing an experiment in a large number of people and showing that the omega-3 product had clinically important effects like lowering triglycerides, submitting that data to the FDA and the FDA says, okay, you can, you can use it to treat triglycerides. And once it's, when it becomes a drug, then reimbursable by insurance. Right. If it's a dietary supplement, it's not reimbursable by insurance and people. So there's no market for it unless it's a drug. Right. So the omega-3 drug is it it's just a question of concentration, right? Like you're just able to get more Virtually. of what you Virtually. want. Right. Perfect. Which is well, awful because be. <laughs> because in the supplement world, you're you're chugging like giant big pills and a lot of them to get to the level to what you need. Like for me, we were looking at the calculator on your website. Um mm -hmm. So for someone who's at five and a half percent omega-3 concentration in their blood, I want to get myself over eight. And looking at your calculator on your website, which guys I really recommend you go to because there's lots of good stuff there. It was 900 milligrams for at least three to four months to kind of correct that that imbalance for me. On, on average, that yeah, I mean, half the people in our study went above eight. Half of them didn't make it starting at 5.5. But that's what you should start with, roughly 900 milligrams. And that's not, that's easy to do. I mean, you can do that eating fish, easy, if you want to eat fish every other day. Okay. You can, you could do, you know, have a, a salmon steak every other day. You'd be getting average 900 milligrams a day of EPA and DHA. You don't have to take a pill. Interesting. So but the, it, it's but, possible. Yeah. Most people pill... don't do that. They won't do it. No, although there's this, I'm, I'm going to do a shout out. There's a, there's a company called, I think they're called Vital Choice. Have you heard of them? Yeah, sure. Yeah, they, they, they ship you fresh 
seafood from Alaska. It's great stuff. But they also have this red Tresca salmon, the canned stuff. Have you ever tried it? No, I haven't tried that. Okay. So, the, and it's seasonal. They don't always have it, but it's a black can. It's called red Tresca in one word. Tresca. And there is, uh-huh. and it's salmon belly. And the mm-hmm. oil, when you open the can, the oil is just the oil from the fish. It's mm-hmm. like electric orange. It looks like somebody put a food coloring in there. And I think a can of that is three grams of omega-3. It's Oh, I, I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. It's huge. I mean, it costs a king's ransom. It's not as expensive as going and buying fresh salmon, but it's delicious. <laughs> okay, good. Well, and sardines. I mean, a can of sardines that's packed in sardine oil, not in, not in olive oil, not in yeah. ketchup or mustard, but can uh, packed in something that you'll get four or five grams of omega-3 from a, a full can if you eat the whole thing wow but you know who eats the whole thing well if i'm eating Very sardines eat i'll eat the whole thing but i'm not going to do it every all day. right yeah see there you go okay uh the, so the drugs there is one drug uh omega-3 drug that is just epa not epa plus dha why it's called vasipa yeah yeah uh, it, that's <laughs> They got started on this, you know, 40 years ago, developing this thing because they thought from the Eskimo studies early on that it was the EPA that was the important molecule. And people in Japan, uh, a drug company in Japan called Mochita, developed an EPA only product back in the 90s. This is now got marketed by other companies. Uh, Amarin particularly is marketing this for cardiovascular disease. And they gave four grams a day, four capsules a day of this stuff um, in a very large study and got really, really good effects on cardiovascular risk reduction. So EPA worked alone to reduce risk for cardiovascular disease. It uh, doesn't mean EPA plus DHA wouldn't work. No. Uh, it just means that EPA did. Uh, and so that's good. Uh, like like to see that. But um, that's one of the drugs. The other one's called Lovesa, and it's got EPA plus DHA. Yeah. And those are really the only two at this point that are and, omega-3 drugs. And it's about and it's about volume. So I have a question to you on the Inuit or Eskimos, I, whatever the proper term is right now. But um, And that is um, a number of years ago, I was introduced to a product that is mammalian sourced omega-3 coming from seal blubber, which is mm-hmm. which is actually something that the Eskimo eat a lot of. Uh-huh. And there's right. a there's a there's an argument that says they actually probably don't eat as much fish as they do consume mammalian sourced omega threes. Have you done any work in that area at all? Because the 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 person behind this supplement, and of course Seal oil is problematic because the whole sealing industry, like we're not going to go there right now, but let's just say yeah, yeah. what he was talking about was that the the arrangement of the omega-3 fatty acids on the glycerol backbone was actually mm-hmm. different than from fish and mm-hmm. was talking about how that it was actually probably more bioavailable to us because our lipases were better adapted to cleaving those omegas off that glycerol, but because it had to do with what position they were on. Yeah, two, two and four, two and three instead of one. Yeah, something like that. Something yeah, like right, that. Right. Yeah, and that was a that was a thing. Maybe 20, 25 years ago, I remember seal oil was kind of hyped for that reason. I mean, you'd have to do a clinical study to to say does this make any difference? I mean, in in any kind of outcome that we measure. Yeah. even triglyceride lowering or a platelet um, a platelet activity uh, or I mean a good study would be with a cardiovascular endpoint or a dementia endpoint you know sh- show that there's a difference I, I yeah. haven't seen the difference um, okay it, so you can you can you know you can weave a story that sounds good but you know, supports your product data. No, I yeah, mean, I just, I thought it was interesting because, you know, in some, at some level I thought, okay, well maybe getting something from a mammal might be more mm-hmm. compatible with our own physiology because we're mammals, but that's not necessarily, that won't necessarily stand up in a study. I don't know. I would just, you know, it was just one yeah. of those things that you yeah, kind of do. I mean, it's interesting. And, you, and I think you're the first person I've ever talked to who brought that up, <laughs> that, that whole seal oil thing. That's, 
that's novel. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned it. Okay. Well, I mean, I I do think it's interesting. So let's go back to cod liver oil for a quick question because for a quick minute, and then we'll probably start to wrap up. Um, what are your thoughts on cod liver oil versus fish oil? Is there is there an advantage of one um, or the other? Or well, of course, cod liver oil naturally has vitamin A and B as well. Um, comes along for the same ticket price. Uh, the amount of omega three per it, it's roughly twenty percent of the fatty acids are EPA and DHA in cod liver oil as opposed versus to. Fish. Fish oil, I mean, the classic standard fish oil, the cheapest, what we call 1812, you know, 180 milligrams of EPA, of EPA and 120 of DHA. Mm -hmm. That's 300. So 30 percent. So it's it's lower in EPA and DHA. You need to take more capsules of it. Although if you take it as a liquid in by teaspoon or by tablespoon, um, which doesn't taste too bad anymore. They've gotten that the flavor pretty well cleared up. Uh, you can get quite a lot of omega-3 in if you're taking five or 10 grams, the equivalent of 10 capsules, you know, but just two teaspoons would That's be the so equivalent much. of 10 capsules. It's not so much, you know, and so you can get in terms of just grams of omega-3 quite a bit from cod liver oil because even though it's lower concentration per gram, it's easier to take it in larger volumes. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And it's, and it is more of a whole food. And to your point, you're getting the vitamin A and the vitamin D, like you're getting more yeah. of a complete food. Um, so, so I think, you know, I'm a fan. Yeah. I, mean, I don't take it, but I, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> to, I don't take it, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't like the All taste, right. you know. <laughs> okay. So the last, the last topic here that I have, I mean, there's more, but I'm going to stop here is this, there's, again, there's another narrative around rancid and poor quality fish oil being more damaging than no fish oil. Um, so I guess that just kind of brings us to this point of what should people be looking out for in their supplements? Is there a line not to be crossed? And are there specific signs yeah. they should look for? Yeah, it's it's, it's a good question. Um, if we take the extreme example of, you know, and there are investigators in Norway who did this study, who they mm -hmm. took fish oil out of capsules, put it in a vat, heated it up, bu bubbled oxygen through it, for crying yeah. out loud, to make it really oxidized. And they did this for like two or three days. And then they put it back in capsules form. And then they did a randomized study with human beings say here's people that get this unoxidized fish oil and here's people getting this really really crappy tasting of course it's a capsule so they didn't know mm -hmm. um and they could and then they measured all kinds of inflammatory biomarkers in the blood and lipid levels didn't find any difference you're kidding no so it wasn't you know so i, I don't worry about them be there being a little bit of of uh oxidation in a fish mm -hmm. oil product. Um, it, it doesn't take many molecules of uh, omega-3 to be oxidized to smell really bad. I mean, it's not like, uh, I think if you look at actually the omega-3 content of an oxidized capsule and a non-oxidized, I'd have to check this for sure, but I think the fatty acid composition, uh, the amount of omega-3 is only very, very, very slightly less in the one that's oxidized. And because is there, are there any damaging effects of the oxidized product? I guess that was the, that's the implication that people are making, but you're saying in this study, in this, in this study, study, they didn't see Norway, evidence of that. They couldn't, they couldn't find it. Um, you know, they were expecting to find something, I think, but, but they couldn't find, now it doesn't mean you don't, you don't do that long-term. Uh, no. Obviously this is an extreme example, but to avoid, I, I, I think to avoid the omega-3s altogether, because you're worried about a little bit of, uh, rancidity or a little bit of oxidation is uh, you got the wrong risk benefit ratio going. Okay. I, I think you okay. sh shouldn't worry about that. I mean, the more expensive products on the market, the, the cleaner they are and the less likely they are to be uh, at all oxidized. But that uh, gelatin capsule that they put them in is really impervious to oxygen mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you know, keeping them in the fridge, that doesn't hurt. Yeah. Um, 
freezing them is not going to get rid of the burp. <laughs> no. No, because it, it taking, takes about uh, takes about two minutes for your pill to not be frozen and to warm up to body temperature and yeah. you know in your stomach. Digestive so, enzymes uh, will help better there. What about um? Actually, true. I forgot to ask you about krill oil. What are your thoughts on that? Because krill oil is very high also in astaxanthin, which is another nutrient that we mm-hmm, really want. Mm-hmm. Good, um, good, 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 good antioxidant. Um, yeah, krill oil is a good source of omega-3. It's in phospholipid form as opposed to triglyceride or ethyl ester form. And a phospholipid's uh, well absorbed. Yeah. You used, they used to say it was like 5X absorbed. Well, it's not quite that. You know, it's not, you know, it might be 50% better absorbed, you know, okay. a little bit. Uh, gram for gram. Uh, I think the only downside of krill oil is that it just tends to be expensive. It's, it's expensive just, and it's, it's messy. Like I buy it and half the time you, when you're pouring capsules into your, into your hand, some capsule in there's leaked. (laughs) So you, and it stains, like it's really, it's very red. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's the astaxanthin of course, but yeah. And that's, it's, so you can't blame that on the krill oil. That's the, whoever the manufacturer is that encapsulated it didn't do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just, yeah, I mean, I keep right. my, my, and, and I, I cycle on and off of it. Like I'll do astaxanthin for a while. Then I'll like, I'll do krill oil for a while. Then I'll go back to fish oil. Then I'll go back to the krill. It's okay. uh, <laughs> you kind of play with it. Well, at 5.5, 5. 5, you need to go back a little more often. Uh, well, I think I just need to do more of it altogether. Um, and like yeah, I said, I've right. been erratic with my omega, so not anymore. I'm on it. Well, welcome to the world. I mean, <laughs> that's the one thing about measuring your levels you, you, you kind of know um, well it wakes you up right it wakes you up and, and teaches you, you what you are or not not getting away with okay so as we wrap up um what would you say are the main things you want people to take away from this interview like what are the thing what are the you know if we had to say three of the most important things you need to walk away with I mean, I can kind of, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but I'd rather you say it. Like, what are the things that people really need to keep in mind when it comes to this topic? Well, I, number one, I've, you know, I'm biased because I invented the freaking test that you ought to measure omega-3 levels. Omega-3 yeah. index is important to know. Just like if you think your cholesterol level is important to know, then your omega-3 level is important to know. It's more predictive of good health outcomes than even a cholesterol level is. Yeah. Um, and so that's important. Um, taking, getting omega threes in is, is more important than worrying about getting omega sixes down. Yep. Don't worry about the omega six, get the EPA and the and, and the important thing is not any omega three, it's EPA and DHA. Both of them. Those are the important ones together. Again, that's the way they come in almost every product. Um, don't count on flaxseed oil or chia seed oil or black walnuts or any of that stuff which has some ALA in it to get you an increased omega-3 index because it's not going to do it. Um, eat fish, eat oily fish, eat salmon, eat mackerel, herrings. You know, those things are, are great sources of omega-3. And if you can't or won't, then take supplements. Yeah, for sure. And actually on the mackerel side, one thing I did read is that king mackerel is actually much higher in toxins than regular mackerel. And I think it's their yeah. position in the food chain being much higher yeah. up. So they bioaccumulate yeah. more of the negative things than we yeah, want. Yeah, that's one. That's one of the high mercury fish. But yeah. that mercury is a whole other story too. As I you know. Said. It's, but but you know, let's not. You know, we'll 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 no, talk about right, that right. on another day. Okay, great. No. So that's um that's really great information. So and and I will second. I will support this thing on the omega quant test because. It taught me something and it moved me to take action in a way that I wouldn't have otherwise. There's yeah. there's there's a very big truth to you can't change what you don't measure. And and you know, the signs and symptoms of being low in omega-3 are so they're sort of so amorphous and they could be so many different things that right. you kind of right. can't rely on them. And otherwise you're just shooting arrows in the dark, right? So oh exactly. You know, I did the big exactly. fancy test that ha- the omega ratio that gives us all these other ratios. But to your point, the one that you really need the most is just the omega three level. And if you I can raise that, a- then everything else kind of falls into place behind it. Yeah, I agree. I think so. Cool. 
So you guys, if um, for anybody who wants to do the Omega Quant test, there's going to be a link in the show notes and you can use NAT5 as a discount code and save 5% off your test. But um, Great. yeah, which is, you know, generous of you guys for the, for the listeners, but yeah. you've given us great. our big takeaways. Anything else? Dr. No, like it's just been great fun. It's good to meet you. And it's been a lot of fun. You do a great job on your interviews. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I try to, I try yeah. to come up with good ideas. And yeah. Questions. Well, you give me some research ideas too. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look into that blood plotting thing in COVID. All right. Yeah. I'll get a little mention at the bottom of the page. Thanks, Nat. You bet. Acknowledgements. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been a total yeah. pleasure. And um, why don't you, so it's Omega. Why don't we tell people where they can either, do you invite people to contact you or should they just go to your website? What's the, what are the coordinates uh, we should be leaving people with? Well, I think to get, get the Omega-3 index, again, it's a, it's a finger stick, a dried blood spot kind of test right there so you don't have to go to a doctor to get it you can order it i think it's at least in the u.s it's roughly 50 bucks retail for the basic omega-3 index test Perfect. something like that yeah um so that's omega quant o-m-e-g-a quant like quantity quantify dot com yeah um and i think um contact stuff is there or you can contact me bill at omega quant that'd be fine too i'm happy to Perfect. respond to people who have questions okay all right. Well, that's awesome. Thank you again so much for today. And um, we'll talk again sometime soon, I'm sure. Great. Thanks, Natalie. It was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Take care.